Looking for some savings. Yeah. I hear you have a KL pass. And welcome to The Travel Show with me, Henry Golding, coming to you this week from Malaysia. Now, to be precise, we're in Kuala Lumpur, and I'm here to see how much of this city can I actually see without burning a hole in my pocket. Now, to do that, I'm going to be armed with one of these. This is a all-new visitor's pass. Now, it claims to offer all sorts of discounts and special promotions, so is it really worth it? And will it help you to make the most out of your trip to somewhere like Kuala Lumpur? That's coming up in a moment, but here's what else is coming up on this week's show. We go behind the scenes at one of London's grandest hotels as it celebrates its 150th birthday and prepares for Christmas. And Krista heads to Los Angeles to try her hand, quite literally, at a new underground dance craze. Whoa. I might make a glover yet. But first... Eight million people live here in Malaysia's capital city, Kuala Lumpur, which the locals simply call KL. And earlier this year, the city was named one of the best value for money places in the world to take a five-star break. But what if you're like me and you want to see the world without having to blow your budget on one spectacular weekend? Well, there is a new way of taking in the city, one that promises for you to see all the sights and save some money at the same time. Now this is the KL Pass. It cost me around 37 US dollars or about 25 pounds and it promises me some big savings whilst looking around the city. So I'm going to put it to the test and see if it adds up. The KL card works much like a prepaid credit card. You get the choice of a one or six day card and that gives you a discounted entry to a number of attractions. The more you use it, the more you save. It also doubles up as a discount card at many restaurants in the city. So, let's give it a test. All right, now this place is amazing. It's an absolute establishment. This is the Colosseum Cafe built in 1921, and that's pre-World War II. So it's been standing this long. The decor hasn't changed at all, but it's the perfect destination to start off my journey, get some food, some fuel for the afternoon, and taste some of that notoriously delicious Malaysian cuisine. All right, and that looks good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Now, the deal here at the Colosseum is that with your KL Pass, you get 10% off uh, the total amount for your bill, uh, which means there are some savings, but of course, this being Malaysia, it is rather cheap anyway and affordable. So how much really are you going to be saving? I'll find out after I demolish this. Ooh. My bill, I can see that there's a discount put on for 10%, which means my bill came up to 1985, that's ringgit, uh, which turns out about $4.55 US, about three pounds. Uh, my total savings is 45 cents US and 30p in pounds. So that means um, every penny counts, I suppose. My card also offers discount on a workshop to learn the art of batik, which is a centuries-old tradition here. These city cards are becoming available in more and more places around the world, either to buy online before you arrive or once you get there. The cards are often run by tourist boards, but also it's worth knowing that some are actually operated by profit-driven companies. 
In Europe last year, an estimated 260 million euros was clocked up on these types of cards. And it's a trend that looks set only to get bigger elsewhere, with cities like New York, Sydney and Cape Town also getting in on the act. The New York Pass is a tourist card. Prices start from $209 or £139 and claims to save you time and money when sightseeing in the Big Apple. You can also use it for discounts on entry to the Whitney Museum of American Art and a Yankee Stadium tour. iVentureCard for Sydney is a smart card that costs $175 US dollars or £116 and works much like a credit card, which allows you completely cash-free entry or access to a number of top attractions. This card offers a three to seven day unlimited access option, which is a bit like an all you can eat buffet. Use the card for a hop on hop off bus tour or visit the Sea Life Sydney Aquarium. And in South Africa, the Go Cape Town card costs from 29 US dollars or 19 pounds and offers discounts to 10 attractions, including two ocean aquariums, great white shark diving, and a number of museums. But free entry venues can only be visited once. The more you use these cards, the better the value for money. But I would hasten to say, yeah, that not all cards actually include public transportation. This means then that some cards yeah, could appear very expensive given the fact that you have to add additional public transport. London is a classic example of this. The London card, the one day card, is £55. If you want to include public transportation, it will cost an additional £14 for the day. That brings it up to £69. That's a lot of money for one day's pass. Can I use this? Oh, okay. okay, thank you very much. Now, one thing you do get with the pass itself is a, a little brochure with all of the attractions, all of the discounts that you can get at the dining experiences, and uh, a lot of suggested itineraries. So it really lets you pack in as much as possible in one day. So where shall I go? Wow. Right. So I was looking through the brochure and decided that uh, the next attraction to see was the Butterfly Park. And it does not disappoint. Have a look at this, a little oasis in the middle of the city. Let's go find some butterflies. This type of pass has its advantages. Here in KL's Butterfly Park, it saved me a few pence, a small saving, but they could add up. So a saving nonetheless. This is a perfect end to a very busy day, might I add. I had the butterflies, the batik, of course, on and off that bus. Uh, but here at Marini's on 57, the flash of the kale pass and, of course, a reservation for dinner, will get you a free mocktail, which is the best thing at the end of a very sweaty afternoon in Kuala Lumpur. Thank you very much. Uh, but what better way to see the sunset than probably one of the highest bars around here. The card has come in handy. The discounts, yes, they're helpful, and if you don't like carrying too much cash or cards around in a strange place, then they're a great idea. But to really get the best value out of these visitor passes, you have to plan your day well and hit the streets early and stay out late, which is great if you're squeezing all that you can out of a destination, but perhaps not so much fun if you like to take your time and explore at your own pace. Well, stay with us here on The Travel Show because coming up... Finger roll. Krista gets her gloves on in LA and gets a lesson in self-expression. <laughs> this is the hardest my brain has ever had to work. <laughs> The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading.
Up next, we head to London and one of its grandest hotels as it celebrates its 150th anniversary. To mark the occasion, the Langham has opened what it claims is the most expensive suite in the city. The price to stay here is an eye-watering £24,000 a night. It's over $36,000. London's grand hotels have always attracted high society's best and brightest, and the city's luxury travel market is booming. According to global brand Mastercard, by the end of 2015, London will be the most visited city in the world, with luxury travellers spending billions of pounds. But these traditional institutions face competition from a new breed of modern luxury hotel, situated in iconic London locations, who say they now cater for the globe-trotting super-rich elite heading for the city. So are the capital's grand hotels at risk of appearing a little old-fashioned? The Langham London was built in 1865 opened by the Prince of Wales. It's a hotel that is celebrating today its 150th year. The space planning of the hotel is quite unique. We have wonderful wide corridors where in the old days they used to have two crinoline dresses and two ladies could pass quite easily. Our Palm Court is the original location for the afternoon tea back in 1865. The Langham Hotel has, because of its history, a natural attraction. We have four or five percent that uh, comes from the Middle East. Uh, we have about 10 percent that come from the Far East, uh, including China, a market that is growing substantially. New markets bring different expectations, so these old hotels are under pressure to modernise the services they offer. I think that Grand Hotels are experiencing something of an identity crisis these days. Up until now, they've done things their way for decades, right since the beginning, and it's been in a very starchy, formulaic, formal sort of way. Um, and people don't really want that anymore. They're looking for something much more informal. How are you doing? All right? Hello, how are you Everything today? well with the customers course, here? It's good. Well, I'm going to go into reception. Oh. See you in a while. What we've learned in the last decade, that when you're talking about iconic suites, is very often they want more space. So I have just finished working with very great international designers to give something to London that is extremely functional. To help mark their 150th birthday, in July the Langham opened its Sterling Suite. With 450 square metres of space and up to six bedrooms, staying there will set you back £24,000, over $36,000 a night. On its opening, it was crowned the most expensive suite in London. It has separate lift access. Uh, the adornment in the drawing room is of a tremendous size. I still need some more time just to fill it with some items. The master bedroom itself has a sitting room area of up to eight to ten people. This is my favourite part of the Sterling Suite. And again, uh, worth to mention here that we have the wallpaper. is handmade wallpaper. And the artwork that we put in there is eclectic with the very best of British art, European art and a touch of Asian aspect as well. Most of the contractors and suppliers were leaving the suite about 6 o'clock and actual arrival was at about 9 o'clock, so a matter of a few hours. A very exciting day. I wish that hotels would stop vying with each other in this way. I think it's completely a marketing ploy and I think it's a bit silly to be honest. I also think it's rather old-fashioned because the modern luxury traveller he may be incredibly wealthy, or she, but they may be dressed in jeans and trainers. Not all the Langham's wealthy guests share such an anonymous dress sense. To successfully market a modern luxury hotel, they must attract high-profile celebrities, and a recent appearance by Lady Gaga gave them a golden photo opportunity 
one which can be liked and shared across the world. I tell you, she's amazing. I didn't expect that. I was setting up the 150 k and all of a sudden she walked down from the front of the hotel very graciously, you know, very posh. She came to me, she gave me a cuddle, a kiss, and she said thank you. And she held my hand and just held, and I walked in front of the house and posed for the paparazzi. I, I, I felt over the moon, the happiest day of my life. And I didn't expect her to do that. I think that Grand Hotels, especially in London, have to be very careful not to become ridiculously exclusive. It would be a huge shame if Grand Hotels forgot their core guest, if British Grand Hotels, London Grand Hotels, forgot British people living in the country who want to come up to London and have a bit of old-style glamour. And I think it's very important that they don't lose sight of that. There are clientele around the world that are asking for the very, very best. Their attention to detail in the luxury stage is second to none. Yeah. They can sense the style, the fabric, the durability, the choice of colours. Luxury today is about entertainment. I think there's been a tremendous stage in the last 20 years in, in London. And it's not just about hotels, but it's about fashion, it's about restaurants, it's about bars. It's a fashion icon of the world. And to end this week, we're heading to Los Angeles. Over recent years, it's been the birthplace of several different dance crazes, from jerking to crumping. But now a different kind of dance, or as some would call it, performance art, seems to be sweeping the West Coast. We sent Krista to try it out. And a warning, this film contains flashing images. This hypnotic type of dance first became popular in LA and the west coast of the United States, but it's well on the way to spreading further afield. And once a year, the best glovers in the world converge here in Santa Ana, just south of LA, for the International Gloving Championships. Glovers perform what are called light shows, kneeling in front of one person to take up their entire field of vision. It's transformed from novelty prop to a form of dance, performance art or even a sport with its own terminology and scoring system. It's a very strange thing, all of this, but you can see how much training has gone into these performances. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. Five years ago, Brian Lim created what's now one of the leading companies that makes these gloves. They've built a huge community of glovers and host the International Gloving Championship each year. My girlfriend actually got me into gloving. She put gloves on me um, at the club of Avalon in LA and I just fell in love. We created an event called Friday Night Lights. First week it was 10 people, then 20, then 30, then 50 to 100, until it was just like, get the hell out of here, kids. So how do these gloves work? It's actually quite simple. These are the E-Lite Micro Lights that actually go inside the fingertips of the gloves, and they have an accelerometer in here so that when you move it, it knows to change the colors even faster. Blitzen is one of the top female glovers on the scene. She makes videos of herself gloving around her hometown of LA. Backstage, I catch up with her while she's getting ready for her light show. It started as expression and now I do it because I really enjoy, um, you know, the excitement that I see from my fans watching my light shows. Is it a growing movement? Is this something that's taking off? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. Um, I can guarantee that you'll start to see it in things like, you know, music videos, more in the news. The last video that I participated in went viral. Under two days, it had 2.5 million views, and that is huge. But it hasn't always been an easy ride for glovers. Some venues and events have banned the gloves, 
amid concerns that they may have unwanted associations with drug culture and that people sitting watching light shows could cause a fire hazard. And that's why we created the hashtag gloving is not a crime because glovers are not criminals. Today you see these glovers here, they're harmless little kids, you know, just trying to practice their art form. So these competitions, when you have, you know, 50 plus judges, you have a scorecard where you're being ranked on what makes a great light show. It really legitimizes the art form itself. Three, two, Back inside, the competition's hotting up. So, time to give it a go myself. Materia was a runner-up in the open gloving contest. All flow comes from one simple move, which is the finger roll. Oh. That is what everyone says. <laughs> this is the hardest my brain has ever had to work. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. So this could lead into going here, going there, oh. going here, going here, going here, 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 here. We'll do it a little bit quicker. Okay. So we'll go one, one two, two, three, three four, four, five, and grab, and turn, okay. and click, here. and meet, and figure it. Boom. Boom! Boom! <laughs> and I couldn't let Materia go before he gave me my very own light show. tougher than it looks, but really good fun. Who knows? I might make a glover yet. Well, that's it for this week, but thank you very much for joining us on our travels. Catch us next week when... I'll be looking back at 2015 here on The Travel Show. Over the past year, we've traveled the globe to bring you stories from all over the world. So join us as we revisit some of our favorites. For me, Henry Golding and the rest of The Travel Show team here in Malaysia, it's goodbye. <laughs>